Stu Did Will, the Story of People podcast, returns this week with Steve Hickey for the second time unofficially. How are you? <laughs> Good. How are you doing? Long Not too no bad. See. Yeah, we're going to try this again. For everyone listening and watching at home, Steve and I did a great episode a couple of weeks ago. I thought it was wonderful, very insightful, very amazing. Um, I'm not going to blame my friends at Restream. However, I did get a note from my friends at Restream saying, sorry, but it was I couldn't download it. It was gone. They were as Canadian as possible and said, sorry, it's gone, eh? So it just vanished, and I was like so frustrated. So, politely reached out to Steve and said, "Hey, um, any chance we could pretend to talk like the first time again and do it again?" And he said, "Yes." So, <laughs> we're back for the first time, second time. How are you, Steve? Welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Looking forward to uh, going through it again. Some new things have happened since we last talked, so it will it'll be an update for the first time. Okay. Well, I mean, this is winding down season one, so you would have been in a couple of weeks ago, but here we are wrapping it up. So uh, I appreciate it. you're down to the last, you're part of the last uh, three episodes here of this first season, uh, which sounds like it's uh, an exciting time to uh, to have you uh, jump on board because it looks like some stuff has happened for you because uh, you know you're still blowing the internet up, which is amazing. So uh, let's start from the beginning, Steve and Eki. What do you do, sir? So I am a local uh, freelance news camera guy in Seattle. It's what I started doing a couple years ago. And, and after a break from starting it back during the protest times of 2020. So generally what I do is I go out in the middle of the night when most of the news networks send all their people home and I film crime stories throughout the night. It's typically some of the more intense stuff. You're going to get homicides, scenes of violence, fires, uh, serious accidents, things are going to have an impact on traffic of the public the next day. And then I license or sell that footage to those news networks for them to tell their stories. Most of them are local. Because it's Seattle, it's a big city. We do get stories that end up going national. But it's kind of hit and miss. It's up and down. When I started doing live streaming at night, and you know, I would be very careful of what things I would go to. If this is... Uh, I don't go to calls that are domestics or sometimes you'll get something that comes in as a shooting, but it's a suicide, that type of stuff. There's no public interest. The public really shouldn't see that. That's something meant for the families affected by those tragedies. But there were certain calls that were pretty wild, SWAT call outs, um, large scale shootouts, things like that. And so when I'd get there, I started going live on TikTok and just putting my phone onto the camera that I was shooting with and to just kind of tell people what was going on. And I was blown away and how many people really like to sit there and watch these things unfold, watch the police response, fire response, sit there for a couple of hours on a SWAT team rollout. And that went from me being behind the camera and nobody really knowing who I was and just licensing footage to then I thought, so a lot of these stories that I would go out and film and send in never get picked up. Usually only about 25 to 35% of what I would shoot would ever air. And it wasn't that they weren't big stories, good stories. It's just, you don't know what's going to happen the next day in national politics or world news. And it gets bumped frequently. And I thought there's so many of these things that I go out and see people's lives that end and the story never gets told. And the surviving family members sometimes have needs. They have GoFundMes. And if we could help get those things out there in the public, that could help a lot of people who are now suffering through these tragedies, as well as be able to educate the public of what goes on every night. So I started doing shorts. I'd do 30 seconds. I'd, I'd take some of the footage I shot. I'd narrate it a bit and just put it out on TikTok and put it out on Instagram. And again, was blown away at the response. And it was getting a lot of people who, you know, really liked seeing what was happening, thought that they were getting information that I was putting out that they couldn't get anywhere else, which was, was true. And then in March, I started talking about the potential TikTok ban and had one of these breakthrough moments where I had a video that I put out that was meant to be, hey, here's the real issue here. My, my personal belief, and, and I have information I put out that also is, is generally accepted at this point, that Facebook had really petitioned for that. They put a lot of money into lobbyists. We're Crazy. trying to say, you know, TikTok's a bad thing. Trust us, we're Facebook, even though they've had to pay fines for the Cambridge Analytica uh, fraud. They had another one just recently in the EU. EU just fined them three quarter, or $1.3 billion dollars for misuse of people's information. But they, instead of dealing with that, they're saying, look at those guys and insinuating what TikTok was doing while they're doing actually that thing. So 
that video took off and it got millions, well over 10 million views. And I got a lot of followers. And then that turned into me realizing that the, I had looked at myself as a camera guy showing his work. And what I found is people were really coming for the storytelling and somebody who was willing to moderately explain what was happening, not say, here's a good guy, here's a bad guy. Although in the Facebook one, I, I do have a pretty strong opinion on. But generally, as far as the crime stuff, it was never like, look at these people doing this or look at that person who's the victim of that. It's This is a mess and it's complicated and it's a big city. And people resonated with that. So I started doing national stories now, ones that I haven't filmed, but I get to do breakdowns of. Um, I'm generally looking for not you know, obscure stories, but ones that maybe don't get as much coverage while touching some of the big ones as well. And just being able to explain it in a voice that well, most of these things are not left or right. The, the, the actual majority of people are somewhere in the center and realize that the extremes are the loudest voices and it can make you feel like you're by yourself and, and that all these crazy people around you are, they're, they're a small amount of people who get the amount of camera time and the amount of national discourse when most of us are sitting in the middle and just want a reasonable outcome. I speaking of your TikTok, I mean that's where I found you or saw you for the first time, and then obviously Instagram uh, is in there too. But um, seven hundred and sixty-three thousand followers with ten and a half million likes. So people are definitely on board with what's going on with your product. And just a few graphics for people watching at home. Uh, I'll send you. You know, you got to go to Steve's TikTok to check it out. I'm sure you've seen him on TikTok if you're on TikTok because it's he's doing very cool reporting. Now this gig, uh, when we first talked about it, I wanted you to compare it to the movie Nightcrawler, which <laughs> initially got me sort of like a question to you about about the similarities to it. Now, obviously, it was it was a bit glorified in Nightcrawler, and and it's a bit more you know the drama and a bit is a bit more amped up. But the premise is that these news uh, agencies need extra content. They they actually pay for this content that is filmed at night. Some of the stuff that's going on, you've chosen not to keep it graphic. You're more topical. You're you're kind of doing some stuff. But some people have dove down the gruesome, gory side of it to get it out uh, going with the if it bleeds, it leads thing. But um, how accurate is that Nightcrawler vi movie compared to? you know, your nightly routine? You know, I think so. There is certainly when you're out there, you're hoping something comes up, right? And there's there's always that balance. I'm also in the, I have a first responder side of my life as well. And, yeah. and when I'm on call, I want the big call to happen when I'm on call, right? I want to go out and be able to use the skills that I've learned and be able to help somebody at that time. That doesn't mean I want bad things to happen, but there's there's that similar thing when you're out there and it's a night I'm going to be out for eight hours. I'm hoping I'm going to get a story. And so there's a balance. I think the difference in Nightcrawler, obviously that was meant to amplify what happens out there. But um, I think most of the people who do what I do, we're not looking to go put a camera in somebody's face on their worst day. You're looking to capture a scene and tell a story. The ones who do do that, and there are some out there, I think that they probably didn't really learn the art of storytelling. And so they, mm. instead of using that, they just go and make it as crazy as possible, as, as gory or whatever term you want to use to make up for the fact that they probably aren't that good at telling a story. And they know that in this world, it's easy to get people to click on something. What I found in my footage, if you know, a lot of the one, national stories, if you scroll through my stuff now, you'll see stuff I didn't film. But if you look at anything that was in Seattle, those are all my clips, um, Auburn, anything in King County, those shots of scenes are mine. And those shots... I think tell a story far better than seeing somebody covered in blood crying because you, there's so many other participants in that. It's not just a victim. There's the first responders. There's the public. There's the yeah. impact, everybody living around there. And you can't tell that story just by zooming in on a person's worst day. And so what I'd found and when I started sending stuff into the stations, the feedback that I was getting was really good. They have people who work for them. 10 plus years and aren't filming like Nightcrawler, uh, you know, getting away from that, that those, those extremes, but they just would come out and shoot kind of wide and Hey, here's the whole thing. Do a couple meetings. I get really tight. I come in and you'll see a lot of uptights on uh, when police officers, there, uptights on their vest, their hands, what they're doing, all those little tactile movements that can show. And, and also some of their facial reactions as they're working. 
then also getting when somebody is going to be transported, you know, getting the, the medic doors closing. Those kind of movements can tell a lot more than something that either is going to get you banned, show that you really have no compassion for the people who are affected, or just for clicks. It's got to be a, an interesting balance because, um, again, back to the it bleeds, it leads. And you remember, what was the uh, what was that show we had in the 90s where where people were um, – the first, I think not co- like there was cops, but then there was the other one which was on the air, film like you know like traffic stop or traffic accidents and stuff. And it see I think it was like on Fox or after Cops where it was basically, uh, real TV. Was it real TV or was I it so. like I remember seeing it? Yeah, yeah. And and so that uh, I think that was all of our first introduction to like why do we want to watch these things unfold and that's the real news and i think at an early age we're all we're watching the news based on what they feed us but i guess people you know i i don't know when they started searching for the new the real news but it seemed to me that that late 80s early 90s is when obviously the arrival of the video camera uh more real-time kind of ability really opened the door to people's um uh, perspective on real news and the real reality of life and why we slow down at car accidents and why we you know go through it it's like we subconsciously don't want to see somebody hanging out of a car but part of us does so we can say we saw it and it's just the weirdest awkward feeling in the world that everyone stops at a car accident everyone right. does, you know uh which is you know far cry from the news back in you know the thirties here with the Seattle times, you know, how they got their news. If it wasn't in the newspaper, it didn't exist. And then you heard about it maybe at the local cafe or something like that. But my, how the times have changed between the Seattle times, how they, you know, report now and how they did back then. And then what you're doing now. So it's just the evolution of, of media is quite, quite amazing to me in that regard uh, so uh as far as that goes it, you're also a first responder so you do that so you have respect for the position of them you have respect for uh so it, does that go into your mindset as well uh are you trying to be conscious of where they are on scene you don't want to be in the way and on a side note to that question have you been on site as a first responder and had somebody maybe an aggressive stringer come in and you're like dude Come on, yep. like, don't you understand? You, you want you understand what we're doing here, you know? For I mean, sure. What's your experience with that? And in that, you know, I, I think sometimes I've gotten accused of having like a bias towards uh, law enforcement or whoever's responding, and I can't say that that doesn't exist because if you have been on that side and seen the mentality and what people really are saying when they're out there, it, it's going to put some impression on you. That doesn't mean that I believe that you know, first responders are infallible or anything like that. I think, you know, generally what I want to do when I come out there is try and document it as best I can so that Mm. if it does turn out to be a bad situation, something was done that shouldn't have been, that it was, it was, it was documented properly and I didn't become an obstruction within it. Right. So I want to be there and be passive. One of the things I try to do in the, and you'll see it in the footage and the way that I film a lot of those in tights, I like to use zoom lenses. I don't go, hang out behind a bush way back there where nobody can see me i'm visible but i like to zoom in i don't need to come and run up what i because of my work i generally know where they're going to run their tape and how they're probably going to build their scene because i may be there first especially in seattle right now seattle has a really tough time they're 12 minutes response for priority one call which is the worst call they can get is gets put in a category one at 12 minutes i'll probably beat them now I don't then want to run out and get a camera set up before they get there, but I'm going to get there first. And so now I have to look at, well, what is this? This is a car accident shooting. What are their marks going to be? How are they going to build this scene? Where can I post up? That isn't going to obstruct that. Also, isn't going again, you know, as family members start showing up. I I have a a personal role. I don't film when the family members show and go into tears and all that. Those can be very salacious shots. Mm -hmm. I think it's a terrible thing to do to somebody on their worst day. But you can tell where they're going to send their command, where they're going to bring people. Because what what I have found is once they ask you to move once, you've kind of broken the seal. You're going to get pushed mm-hmm. again. You're going to get redirected. If you set yourself up in a way that they don't even have to ask you to move, you're probably going to get better access throughout the rest of the response time. 
than when they go, because they'll usually also radio as soon as they see somebody or they have to make contact with them. First thing they're supposed to do is memorialize that by getting on radio and say media is on scene. At that point, they've all heard it and they're like, okay, that guy, that guy's media. And you've kind of gotten put into a category as somebody they need to be conscious of. And, you know, I do use commercial equipment, which helps when people run out with cell phones. Um, they're generally you know, just more aggressive. They may live in the area. They're going to have whatever their beliefs are about what happens in that area, what the response is like. I try to stay away from all of that. And people come up, Hey, what do you know? What do you, you know, what are you seeing out here? And just say, I don't know yet, man, we're just filming, see, see what happens yeah. and give it some time for the information to come in, but let the scene decide what's happening, not me and not the way that I'm interacting with people. How did you decide to get into it? How did you do it? So back in 2018, my past background was in real estate develop, development and home building. And at a point where we were starting to develop larger communities, you have to wet the dirt in the summertime as you're digging because there's a dust control component. And so we were looking at, do we buy tanker trucks or we could buy fire trucks for a lot less money? And, uh, and they're kind of cool. It turns out the public really likes them. It's in, so I thought, okay, let's start doing that. So I started buying retired fire trucks from different municipalities like Eastside Fire and Clallam County. And they're pretty cool trucks. They're not, as, they're not like old rinky-dink rigs. Some of these things reach end of life in 10, 15 years. So I started using them. I didn't realize how much those speak, spoke to the public. I didn't grow up wanting to be in the fire service. I, you know, it just wasn't my thing. Other people live for it. So we go just fuel these up and the amount of people want to get pictures or let their kid jump in, get a, get a picture behind the wheel. I thought, man, there's, we got to be do, doing something better with these. So Christmas came around to 2018. Uh, I'm sorry, 2017. And I remember growing up in Marysville, the Marysville Fire Department would take one of their old trucks, put a Santa Claus on it, and drive through neighborhoods really slow with the lights and sirens going and Christmas lights on it, collecting canned foods. And then that would go to a local food bank. I thought we could do that. We have four of these now. And there were a couple guys who worked for the company who were heavier set and could put the, the uh, you know, put the costume on and go with it. And we yeah. started going out and it took off. And then King Five decided to do a story on it. There was a guy, uh, he doesn't work at King now, but named Ted Land, who did like an Emmy nominated reporter. He's done some really cool stuff. He also did a lot of human interest pieces for them. And he said, hey, can I come ride with you for a night? I'd like to do a story. And, and I've been a news nerd since I was a little kid. I was watching the Today Show in like grade school. And uh, so I was like, yeah, come on out. I, you know, I knew exactly who he was. I don't think he's somebody who walks around town getting recognized a lot. I knew who he was. Yeah. He's like, this is amazing. He comes out and I'm expecting a sound guy, a camera guy and Ted. It's just Ted. He brings everything. He's got GoPros over the shoulder, microphones, all of it. And he's hooking cameras up, you know, putting GoPros in different angles the whole night running around and getting interviews from people who donated food. And then one for me at the end of the night. And the next day he aired a piece and I'll send you the link to it. And it was so good. And I thought, wow, how cool is that? He, he saw something said, I want to tell that story, did, did a huge amount of work. And 24 hours later, it was airing. And I thought, what a, what a cool job. Fast forward, 2020 comes, building has to stop. The construction industry is out of hold. And I'm trying to decide, you know, is this what I want to do the rest of my life? Or what do I want to do when I grow up? And since then, I, you know, every now and then I was on the road a lot. I would send Ted videos of different things, things on I-5 or whatever that they would run. And uh, then comes the protests. And Seattle was a huge hotbed for that. It was a unique part of the country in, in that respect for uh, Seattle and Portland. And one of my favorite movies was a movie called LA 92. And it's a documentary actually. And they did a, a about a two hour piece on the LA 92 riots that were subsequent to the Rodney King beating. Mm. And I thought it was a really well done piece because they didn't come in to say, here's good, here's bad. It was more, here was the lead up decades previous, then the incident, then what came after that. And good and bad are interchangeable. There really isn't a clear villain or victim here. They Different people can have different titles throughout the whole thing. It's complicated, but let's at least make it make sense. And I thought when 2020 was coming, I thought, you know, eventually they're going to want to tell this story. Maybe I could go out and create a library of footage because I have a, a skill set and I have the equipment to do it. I'd put it on a shelf and maybe 10, 15 years from now, I'd have that footage. And that was it. That was really kind of my foresight into it. Then as that continues on, I'm out, you know, whether there was Chaz and then Chop up on Capitol Hill, I'm spending 12, 14 hours a day out there going out different areas of the city, interviewing people. 
NBC and ABC and CBS, they all come to town because now they want to get in on the action. And we were parking in the same parking lot, where which was good for me because they have security people with them, which means I can park my car there with all the stuff in it and not have to worry sure. about it. Yeah. And again, kind of like with Ted Land, there were people there who are on TV that probably don't get recognized months, but I'm a news nerd. And I was like, that's Steve Patterson. And that's David Douglas, who's a NBC producer behind the scenes, but I, I, I've recognized him instantly. So at some point over the next couple of days, we finally get to chatting. Like, what do you do, man? And so I show him my footage and they go, have you ever thought about licensing to national media? And I kind of shrugged it off. And then we started talking more and thought, yeah, let's do this. This would be great because it could kind of fund my passion and help me keep doing this. And then that turned into me going to Portland and doing the same thing. And then from there is I realized I kind of had a unique skill set and talent to film this stuff a certain way. It took off. And so then I started getting more into what you call the stringing side and, and doing the, the local stuff. So it's this odd progression through that. That's the name of the gig too. It's called a stringer. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, keeping in that theme, you don't need to release your bank account, but how did, I mean, can you make a full-time living at it? Is it more piecework? Does it pay well? It can. I think what I have found in the past, and this is very true to Nightcrawler, um, you know, you go out every night and you make a little bit if you get a story. If you could get, you could even film something that's amazing and it just doesn't sell, right? So you can go a whole week. And, you know, when Mar a Lago got raided and then there was also uh, Queen Elizabeth was getting ready to pass or pass, I, you, I don't care what happened in the streets, you could not sell because even local media puts the first 10 minutes of every broadcast to things that have nothing to do with local. Sure. So those come up. Um, then I had one in, in Renton last summer that was a seven-person shooting, which is considered a mass shooting. And I was there before the police. I was around the corner editing when the shots started firing. So I heard it, got up there. It was a mess of a response without going through all the uh, challenges yeah. I had. But they sent fire in too early before the scene was safe. So I even had firefighters fighting with people, wild stuff. And wow. I went live on TikTok. And so I started getting messages from national media who have my phone number saying, hey, we want to buy, we want to buy. And I'm thinking, this is it. I'm, you know, I'm making a bunch of money tonight. And then over the next 12 hours, as we got to the bottom of it, it really wasn't a shooter. It was a shootout. And shootout mm -hmm. pay a lot less than shooters because shooters, the public feels like they could be the victim of a shooter. They don't think they're going to get caught in a shootout. And in itself, even though seven people's lives were heavily affected that night, one of them didn't live through that night. It got a, there was a lot less financial value to it. And it was one of those moments where I was like, this, that was one of the th times where I thought, man, I need to do more of this. And that was one of the first stories I put out on TikTok because I thought, this, this is rough that I'm beholden to whatever's happening in the world and somebody else deciding what the value of the end of someone's life is. That that's a bog well that boggles my mind, but it also makes sense from the standpoint of you know, um, to your point about local news and getting buried and and all the rest of it. It's it's really just what the news deems uh, worthy of us to watch, yep. which is why I want to circle back to your TikTok in a minute, um, how th that went viral, and so um, how did you and how do you decide? what content you're putting on TikTok? Is it topical to the minute? Is it sort of like just a general interest story? Because 10 and a half million views is a lot and 800,000 followers is a lot. And clearly you've touched on people that want to follow you for these quick hit information sessions. So there's a mix of things. I, I would like to cover every single story that comes in, but I don't think the world can handle that much of me in a day, right? There's, you can <laughs> oversaturate out there and they can go, I've, I've had enough. I get what you do. I don't need to see it anymore. I, so a handful of things come in. There's me going out, trying to find stuff at night. Most of those stories I'll tell, because I think if, if I can get the, get it shot, it's good for the departments that respond. I have, a, um, there's a lot of goodwill from the departments for me to come out and cover these, which has been good. I think a lot of them have adversarial relationships with much of the media. I haven't gotten much, very much of that. There've been a couple departments that's been sticky here and there, but for the most part, pretty good. Then I'm always scouring the news every day and I have a researcher now who's always scouring for stories throughout the day. And then I get a lot of requests now too, people saying, hey, this happened to my family, the media's not really covering what you cover. 
out of that, we try to put out three to six a day. Wow. I have to do some of what I was just complaining about, you know, with, with national media is I may get 15 that come across my desk at a day and now I have to decide what are the three to six we're going to have time for. My hope is to continue to expand this. We're now going to be on YouTube next week in a much bigger way. We're going to start pushing on Twitter and be able to get to 10 plus stories a day and continue to scale up. What I also found, you know, on TikTok, we found five is kind of the most. Once I go beyond five on TikTok, the, we start getting diminished return on views as the evening goes on. I think people really are like, man, I saw you all day. I just want to come here and like enjoy, you know, smile, laugh, whatever. And some of my stuff can be darker. We now do some funny stories. I try to do two or three a week of, you know, Taco Bell is suing Taco John's over this, the trademark for yeah. Taco Tuesday, kind of silly stories like that. Um, I also do try and put a bit of humor. If it, it's kind of a sticky thing where you get in like George Santos, most people know who he is. I don't consider that to be a serious person. I, I think it's it's bizarre. I think his story's interesting on how he got to where he is without getting checked. Now he is, but I, when I tell a George Santos story, we have a Lion King graphic that we've put his face on there and we call him uh, Lion George. And you know, we, or we call him Ly George Santos, the Lion King, L-Y-I-N. I have some fun with that, but most of my stories where I was going with is, is they get kind of dark and so people can only handle so much. And sure. then I'll do some of the silly ones and kind of mock certain people like, you know, another one, Mike Lindell, who doesn't believe the election was what it was. I don't think just yeah. because he believes the election may have been fraud that he's not a serious person. He's just fundamentally not a serious person. They're serious people who believe what he believes. He's Absolutely. not one of them. So his stories kind of turn into a bit of a roast. But I don't think that diminishes from the validity of the rest of the work. But so in keeping with that, then, though, I mean, news, there's Fox News, there's CNN, there's MSNBC, and then there's independent people. And generally, people try to pick a side. I, I know a handful of middle people. Uh, but when it comes to the fact that you've had 10 and a half million views and 800,000 followers on TikTok alone, what is your inbox like? Is it full yeah. of hate? Is it full of <laughs> hate on both sides? It, it, you know, do you get more middle comments? What's your ratio now that you're in that space and actually people are relying on you for content every day? So most, the majority of it is good. It's positive. I'm not on Twitter yet. I will be next week. That's a different place. So I, you know, I'm kind of getting, getting my flak jacket sure. on, ready to go into that and see what happens. Um, <laughs> Instagram's pretty okay. Uh, it's hit and miss there. Instagram's more follower driven where TikTok, yeah. if you go and look at your traffic, usually 90% of my views come from for you page, the FYP. And a lot of that's non-followers who may decide to follow at that point, but sure. they don't know who I am. They don't know what my thing is. Instagram, they kind of know what I do. Um, but as the inbox, I don't have, you can't send me a message on TikTok unless I follow you back. And I don't follow many people for just that reason. I only follow people that I actually know and would communicate with. But you can hit me up on sure. Instagram and say all kinds of foul things that you may want to tell me. <laughs> I do get plenty of that. Um, or people, I get a lot of requests. Will you cover my story? Will you cover my situation? Well, I mean, I think one of the funnest things to do on those things is to actually take those hate comments and make comments. I think that's a whole other video stream you could do called called uh, the hate of Steve and just yeah. go for it and and, <laughs> and and call those people and see how long they stick around for it. Uh, so as it's building and it's blown, I mean, it seems to be just, I mean, since we talked four weeks ago in the great uh, uh, vanishing of our chat, Lots has happened. What's the plan here then? What, what what do you plan next for this thing? What will you do next? And are you going to retire from it? Do you think? So I do hope to ride this out till I can't work anymore. I think this is it because it doesn't feel like work. And this is one of the few things I've ever done in life where I'm still kind of blown away. I'm getting paid to do it. Um, yeah. You know, I think right around the time we talked last, I'd gotten into a different funding model with TikTok. So with TikTok, I have to be over 60 seconds. The viewer has to watch a little bit longer my video in that I get paid actually a fair amount of money per million views. I can talk about whatever I want. I, I you know, I do do pro TikTok stuff. I'm going to have kind of a negative TikTok one, some things that I don't like about the platform next week, and I'll get monetized for that as well. They don't tell me what I can or can't talk about. We're going to push into YouTube, start, hopefully start making more there. There's now a full-time editor on staff um, who's in here every day. So now I just film, I do research film, then he edits we're going to add a third person who's hopefully going to help with the research side and possibly an editorial 
uh, once a week as well as well as a newsletter uh, twice a week. And then off of that, now that I have a studio beyond the space I'm sitting at, we have a thousand square foot studio upstairs that's being put together and we're able to bring other in people who have podcasts specifically or have uh, content that they want to help produce. They can come out here and batch record and then the editor here will take care of that for them. And we're doing it for a pretty reasonable price. The idea of it is to help us cover the bills here. So whatever I want to do, yeah, not meant to be in itself a profit center business. It just makes it to where... I'm no longer beholden to the bills. I can do what I want. Well, I think, I mean, I think that that's going to, I mean, blow up I, to the point where I would imagine that your stringer career actually comes to an end and you just focus on this other content. Um, because we all do what we do as, as a hobby. We do things to get paid. We do things, you know, that, that complement our lives. But I mean, the way that you're, you're servicing content and the way you've organically grown, tells me that people are in desperate need of what you're offering and i think it's i think it's a great thing and and uh, would that would that make you excited to to go down that road and obviously change this course that you thought you were on are you sad to maybe put the stringer thing to bed or did it all kind of work together towards your final goal here? In that I like now? stringing. There's something nice yeah. about being out at night, especially coming from a very intense background of real estate development, home building. That's an intense life. Yeah. Everything's going 100 miles an hour. There's many different moving parts. Your phone's always going. When I leave at nine o'clock and I don't come home till four in the morning, my phone doesn't ring. People aren't, you know, it's the life. Life is quiet. There's no traffic. Weather's nice. I'm shorts and a hoodie and 50 degrees kind of guy. Like I, I like the night just works for me. Yeah. So for that, you know, going out, I do miss it. Um, I'm hoping to add a photographer who may be able to go cover that. And then I'll kind of narrate the way I do just because it, it, that side of me, ironically, a lot of times for stringers, they, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they get pushed back, they get pushed out. It's opened up a lot of doors of access for me. And a lot of law enforcement officers actually, you know, send me tips and stuff in my DMs or, Hey, we're over here. Why don't you come over here? That kind of thing. That's, that's opened up a lot of doors that I don't want to see closed because even if I'm not stringing, I might still want to tell local stories. Absolutely. Open that up a lot. Um, and uh, I'll let you go here in a minute. Cause I, at any minute you can get called out to run around and <laughs> go save someone's life, which is, uh, super honorable. And I, and I, you know, thank you on behalf of people that need your services. Uh, I'm in Canada, you're in America, but it's the same. You're helping people and that's wonderful. Um, how competitive is the stringing business in Seattle versus what you've heard about LA or New York? Nothing's as comp you know, c competitive as LA or New York. You, you get out there and there's 20 others and, and they're you know, getting close to a fist fight to get the better shot. That's part of what I think drives some of the graphic footage too, by the way. Sure. It's not individuals, it's them feeling they need to outdo the other person next to them. Out yeah. here is less competitive in that you won't run into 30 people, but you will run into three or four people like myself who are extremely competitive. So you don't get the crowd mentality, but those of us who are here are extremely protective. Uh, we foster the relationships that we've built and we're very protective of them. So um, I, if, I, if I was a new person coming in, I'd rather go compete with 30 randoms than the three or four locals here <laughs> any day of the week because you're going to get a lot more uh, intense competition here from those three people. Well, since we've spoken unofficially before, you've uh, added a whole bunch of stuff to your life, uh, which looks like you've got a wonderful, wonderful next 20 years in front of you um, of, of just providing amazing content of, of where this world of media is going. And I want to congratulate you on that. And it's very exciting to hear. And I appreciate the time uh, for you making to come on this thing uh, a second time because uh, I know you're a busy guy, but uh, I, I really think it's a uh, uh, great. And I, and I love the content that you're doing. So why don't you tell everybody where they can find you on all the platforms, including the new spot on sure. Twitter. So uh, it's Photog Steve 81. It's the same name on every platform. Uh, I went and grabbed them months ago, thankfully, because now there's a bunch of uh, fake accounts using my picture and my videos. But uh, sure. if you get on there, it's Photog Steve 81. And uh, I'm not verified on this. I don't pay for verification. I won't do it. But you'll start seeing videos pop up more and more. Uh, uh, the one on YouTube, there's an older video just so we could show people it was the right one. And then you can also find a link. If you're on TikTok, tap the link button and it'll take you to YouTube or Instagram and you know you're at the right one. And for everyone listening uh, and 
uh, not watching, we'll, we'll put it in the graphics of, uh, of when I put this episode up and you'll be able to click on there and, and get this Steven. I think it's very important. I think Steve's doing extremely important work outside of the stringing side of it. I think the real news that he's presenting and how he's doing it is wonderful. And uh, it is the future of media. So good on you, buddy. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you don't have to save anyone's life today, but definitely <laughs> uh, thank you for going out there and uh, putting it out there. Plus adding all the rest of it to, to your world. And on top of that, you're a dad. So uh, good on you, buddy. Um, thanks again th uh, for coming on. Do did build a story of people podcast. And uh, hopefully you'll come back in season two and give us an update. Thank you. Awesome. Steve Hickey. This week, Do Did Will, the Story of People podcast. Thanks, everybody.